Hello everybody. I am Jay Ramanan and this is my wife Vrinda Ramanan. We are both very happy to participate in this webinar series organized by the IMF. Together we will be presenting the mountains of our destiny, the Indian Himalaya. I am a practicing architect, a passionate photographer, exhibit art and an associate member of the Indian Mountaineering Foundation. I have held several one-man shows in major cities that have been inaugurated by stalwarts like Tenzing Narge, Edmund Hillary, Group Captain Rautela, and Colonel Chauhan, Cricketer Krishnamachari Shrikan, and Yen Ram of the Hindu. I am Brinda. I am a Bharatanatyam dancer. And when I'm not dancing, I'm trekking with my husband in the Himalaya or in the Western Ghats. We have been doing just this for the past 45 years. We completed our basic and advanced mountaineering courses at the Nehru Institute of Mountaineering, Uttarkashi, in the 1970s. We have introduced about 400 children to the high altitudes of the Himalaya. Together, we have authored books, The Joy of the Himalaya, Surrealism and Photography, Sri Rangam, Bhuloka Vaikuntam, and Thirumala Kaliyuga Vaikuntam. We are currently working on the book, The Mountains of Our Destiny, that is dedicated to the living and breathing edifice, the mighty Indian Himalaya. In our presentation today on the mountains of our destiny, the Indian Himalaya, we will be talking about two treks that we undertook, one from the northeastern end of the Himalaya in the Pemako region in Arunachal Pradesh, the land of the dawn lit mountains and the other from the northwestern part of the Himalaya to the Barafsar in Kashmir, the paradise on earth. Arunachal Pradesh lies on the true right bank of the river Brahmaputra. An exciting boat ride took us across this majestic river to Pasigat, from where our foray into the sacred Pemako region started. The mighty 2,900 kilometers long river Brahmaputra is the lifeline of the people of Arunachal Pradesh. This river has a great impact on the social economic life of the people. The Yarlung Sangpo originates in the Angsi Glacier near Mount Kailash. It moves eastwards, taking a U-shaped turn known as the Great Bend between Namche Barwa and Gyalaperi Mountains that mark the northeastern point where the Himalaya begins. Crossing the Tibetan Plateau, it becomes the Sayang and later flows as the Brahmaputra in Assam. Traveling from Pasigat, we had to deal with dark skies, mud and slushy roads, frightening landslides and overflowing nalas. While planning a trek in this area, one should remember to have many buffer days as landslides can prevent movement for several days and eat on our trekking schedule. After a night's stay at Jenging, we reached Tuting, which is the starting point to the Pamako. The Upper Siang Valley conjures dreamy images of rain-fed, lush, evergreen forests, which shelter a rich variety of vibrant wildlife and unusual plant life. The mist covering the forests perpetually contribute to the ethereal dimension of the landscape around. We trekked through this valley along the meandering river Siang. Crossing millet and rice fields, walking alongside streams and treading unsteadily on this perilous hanging bridge, we crossed the river Siang and reached the Kuging village. This bridge was made from bamboo held together with rotten stems and iron ropes. Some of the bamboo on the floor of the bridge were broken or missing. The Galongs, the Adis, the Apatanis, the Nishis of this land embrace an animistic religion that eulogizes nature, the sun and the moon, the Doni Polo, literally meaning the sun, moon. The Lake Danakosha that lies in the Pamako region is of great significance to the Buddhist devotees. We listened to simple stories of faith, of the presence of the island of Dharma and the peak of Chittapuri, the heart of knowledge that can be found at Lake Danakosha. The houses in this area are built on stilts. 
with bamboo pillars, bamboo spliced walls and a veranda around the home. The roof was made of dry leaves. Some of the houses are quite big. The entire community gets involved in construction work. There is one large hall, the main room, which has the hearth, where they cook, dine, and spend time together as a family watching television. The empty space beneath the structure is used to house their poultry, pigs, and other farm animals. Here you can see two young men displaying the horns of a domesticated mitun that they had killed for meat. The affluence of a tribal household is measured by the number of mituns they had slaughtered for their meal over generations. This tribal lady stands proudly in front of the mitun horns displayed on the front wall of her home. The Adis are a very hospitable and fun-loving lot who work tirelessly weaving baskets, designing canes, and carving on bamboo hollows or hunting while in the forest. Evenings are always devoted to drinking their favorite apong. Their fancy headgear decorated with horns and feathers from their hunt and colorful beads are unique to the people of these parts. We had to trek through this forest for five hours before we reached our next campsite. The forests were so dense and dark as sunlight could not penetrate through the thick canopy several meters high. It was an interesting experience crossing streams on unsteady logs and leech covered ground. It was a supreme test for our mental and physical faculties. Our next campsite was called Site Camp, which was marshy. There were makeshift sheds in all the campsites. The biodiversity in these rainforests are unimaginable. The Adis compete with the animals and birds occupying these parts for survival. Besides catapults and shotguns, they hunt with bows and arrows made from bamboo and set ingenious traps designed locally to catch birds, squirrels, wild pigs, rodents, barking deer, and even snakes. Pits are dug to ensnare bigger prey. Traditionally, the rituals to bail themselves out of killing big animals was expensive, and hence, the Adis were careful. A tribal in his entire lifetime would kill only 25 deer, but today it numbers to more than 100. The innocent Adivasis should be made to understand that their changed hunting practices are causing havoc and disturbing the ecological balance and will affect them adversely. It is interesting and distressing to note that these Adis are obsessed with hunting. They always carry their catapults and rifles around and bring down every bird they see and capture every small rodent that capers around. I remember every time I heard a bird chirp, I would mentally request it not to make any sound that would attract the attention of the Adis accompanying us as it would be its last. This is Lama Kukut, a campsite from where the peaks of Namche Barwa, that is about 7,782 meters high, and Gyalaperi, 7,150 meters high, can be seen at a great distance away. At Lama Kukut, the relentless rain made it impossible to move further for nearly three days. A mysterious whoosh sound led me to the point from where I could see a white streak tumbling down against the beautiful background of the rich green forest. This was the Lara Luri Falls. The waters from this waterfall joined the Siang below. The main aim of our trek was to capture images of Namche Barwa and Gyalaperi. We had trekked thus far and waited for five days, but these two peaks remained always covered by clouds and the mist hanging around did not lift. When our senses dulled with despair and we lost all hope, and were ready to leave. The rain stopped, the clouds passed, parted, and much to our delight, the sun rose from behind these snow-capped peaks, revealing Namche Barwa and its sister peak, 
Gallipedi. The Sangpo River forms her spine. Pilgrims go through the Pemako to reach and circumambulate the sites of Devakota, Titapuri Mountain, and the Danakosha Lake. The Pemako region is Beyul, or the holy land of the Sangpo, the promised land of the Tibetans. Welcome to Kashmir. From the northeastern point of the Himalaya, we move to the northwestern part that lies in Kashmir, the Valley of Lakes, a veritable paradise on earth. The crowning glory of our country, Kashmir, even today is famous for its lakes and houseboats. Before we embarked on our trip to the frozen Barafsar Lake, located at 4,605 meters, we spent two days in our luxurious houseboat on the Nigin Lake. Our very good looking chef taking a long drag on his hookah. Starting from the pretty hamlet of Sarbal, near Sonamar, located on the banks of the river Sin, we hiked up to the Durinar Meadows. We had to cross over the boisterous Sarbal Nala on two long, shaky, slippery logs placed precariously across the river. We hiked up a steep, boulder terrain from Baltal to Durinar Meadows, situated at 3,506 meters. We reached late in the afternoon and were welcomed by the shepherd, a gujar and his bleating sheep. This picturesque meadow has a stream flowing down to join the server. We pitched our tents and rested here for the night. The weather was very congenial as we undertook this trek in the month of July, August 2019. The next morning, when the shepherd set off to graze his sheep, we also moved to our next campsite treading on snow fields and rocky terrain. The evening charmed us with this rainbow racing from behind the mountains on the opposite range after a pleasant shower. The next morning, we reached the partially frozen Durinar Lake, located at an altitude of 4,171 meters, a crystal clear blue lake safely concealed by the fortress of giant granite spires. The night sky opened up a twinkling world of stars. The arm of the Orion in the Milky Way galaxy created an ethereal scene. We walked further up and a little below Lake Nilnag, we pitched our tents and settled down as it started to rain. The site was unfit for pitching our tents, hence we put the tents on the snow. The next day we reached the partially frozen Nilnag Lake and set up our final camp there. The Nilnag Lake, located at an altitude of 4,269 meters, lies parallel to the Innominate Glacier. The entire trail was icy and slippery, and the melting snow was making it difficult for us to walk. Here you can see two of our staff looking towards the Zojila from our final campsite. From here on, we trudged over steep snow slopes to the Barafsar, the highest frozen alpine lake of the Kashmir Valley located at 4,605 meters. Although L. Watts discovered this lake in 1933, it was brought to the public notice only in the year 2017. From this vantage point, one can see the fascinating 5,425 meters tallest peak of Kashmir, Mount Kolahai, Gwash Brari, or the goddess of light on the extreme right. The Kazim Ridge on the Sindh Valley, the Lidar Valley, Zojila, Whalehead, Crystal Peak, Innominate, and many other peaks could all be seen from here. Close to the Barafsa Lake, there is a pass called the Kolahai Pass through which one can reach the Lidar Valley and get to Pahalgaon. We could not cross this pass because the terrain was steep, scree slope covered with wet snow, and it was too slippery to walk on. We returned to Sonamar taking the same route, glissading all the way that we had used to ascend. This is the jacket of our forthcoming book, The Mountains of Our Destiny. Ramanan and I have now embarked on documenting the various parts of the Indian Himalaya in our book, The Mountains of Our Destiny. It is an honor that it will be published by the national daily, The Hindu. This is a unique coffee table book that features the Indian Himalaya from Arunachal Pradesh in the Northeast to Kashmir in the Northwest. 
It is a result of 45 years of trekking and climbing in the high altitudes of the Himalaya. There are about 350 mesmerizing photographs of the mountains in its various moods and from different seasons. In this photograph taken on our trek to Green Lake in Sikkim, you can see the peaks of Sugarloaf and Tent Peaks. From another trek in Sikkim, we captured dawn at Gochala. The peaks of Kanchanjunga and Gocha can be seen here. This image is from my pre-Everest expedition to Kapru Dome in 1982, organized by the Indian Mountaineering Foundation. The night skies are always exciting at high altitudes. This was at Tapavan in Garhwal region. You can see Mount Shivaling towering in the background. Again, Mount Shivaling with blue sheep in the foreground as seen from Nandanban. Trans Himalayan landscape are magical. Here is one such taken at Ladakh. This image of the elusive snow leopard with its skill was taken in 2019 at Kiba. We were lucky to capture this shot in its natural habitat. Our book also features a lot of black and white photographs. This is from the Barashigri glacier with a bird-like cloud hovering above. An old Bodhisattva from Zangla. The Atmalinga photographed during our inner parikrama around Mount Kailash. This is at the south face of the Dakshamurti face of this holy mountain. We hope all of you enjoyed our presentation. We offer our sincere thanks to the Indian Mountaineering Foundation for giving us this opportunity to interact with all of you through this webinar program. Thank you and Jai Hind.